you start with a question? Yes, thank you. I'm Rachel Korberg from the Ford Foundation where I work on the Future of Workers Initiative. Thank you, Rachel. So my first question is about the U.S. labor market. Uh, given that there is a lot of data availability about the U.S., it's one probably of the most studied country in the world. And this topic of the future work, it, it's a very important topic. If you try to uh, search in, in Google, you get all about uh, 4 million results in less than one minute. So there are many, many studies and research out there. But because there are many opinions and different sometimes results about the U.S. labor market, I would like to get your views about like what are the elements that you think we should consider when thinking about technology in, in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll start with three numbers that I think really tell the context of how the fourth industrial revolution is playing out in the U.S. Um, so the first is 44. 44 years is um, how long the average American worker has experienced wage stagnation. Um, the second number, which gets a little bit at why is this happening, um, is 6.2x. So um, productivity is actually outpacing growth in wages 6.2 times. So it's not that we should expect there to be a perfect one-to-one -one relationship, but this is really quite extraordinary. In fact, economists often refer to it as the great decoupling um, that started in the early 70s, and we really see this big divergence between wages and between productivity. Um, so the type of productivity that we're seeing in the fourth industrial revolution much of that is really going to corporate profits, to those who are at the top of the income distribution, rather than towards wages and towards average wages. And then the third number is 50%. So that's really the, the result of all of this. 50% um, is the likelihood that I earn more than my parents. My parents had a 90% likelihood of earning more than their parents. So um, to me, what this really gets at is this idea in the US, the, the term of the American dream, this possibility to rise above your beginnings through hard work. Um, and I certainly wouldn't argue that that's really been in reach for many people in this country. Um, but it, it has been, to an extent, more so than it is today. Um, so what does this mean? What does this kind of economic picture look like um, when we think about the fourth industrial revolution and how it's going to play out here? Well, we already see that productivity gains are really accruing to the top. Um, at the same time, we know that a lot of the technologies that really make up the fourth industrial revolution, not all of them, but, but many of them, um, they really compete with that sort of routine manual types of tasks that tend to make up low wage jobs here. And they tend to complement um, and really augment um, tasks that are non-routine, especially those that are non-routine and cognitive. So picture, um, on the one hand, fast food work versus um, a systems engineer, for example. Um, so the risk, as you can see, is really that as this fourth industrial revolution continues to play out, that it really exacerbates these deep structural inequities that have now been playing out in the US for quite a few decades. Um, okay, so that was really depressing. Um, my wife always tells me not to start with statistics because I'm going to depress everybody. So I'm going to try to turn it around right now um, and say something a little bit more optimistic. And, and you know, that is that it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to play out this way. Um, the technologies aren't um, disposed necessarily to playing out this way. We as a society really get to decide and shape um, how they roll out and to ensure that they actually can benefit everyone rather than just those at the top. Um, what I think is concerning to me is that um, in the US and, and to an extent globally, this assumption that it's just gonna play out this way, that the robots are coming for our jobs, that this is really going to um, harm low-income workers, that's such a basic assumption. And I think it's made our policy conversation about these issues very unimaginative, actually, um, and not very collaborative. So for example, universal basic income. Um, this is often put forward in the US context as the idea of every citizen should get some amount um, of basic income transferred to them because there just won't be enough jobs. Um, and I really enjoyed your comments about expansion of social protection, I think, um, you know, on the one hand, expanding um, social insurance, expanding social protection, and doing it without the same types of administrative barriers we currently have um, is very evidence-based and exciting. 
But it's not the silver bullet to this entire issue. And that's often how it's framed in policy conversations right now. Um, I think the first challenge is that you know it's telling us to give up on this idea that hard work can and should lead to economic security, that that's something um, a country and our economy should be able to provide. And the second is I think it's um, misunderstanding what work is to many people, which is not just a paycheck, but is meaning, is community, is purpose, is dignity. So. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the policy conversation um, include universal basic income, but kind of get beyond that too, get a little bit more creative. Um, so what else is there? One example I'll give um, is I think we see growing interest in these kind of collaborative solutions that bring together government, business, and workers. Um, and I would strongly advocate that um, low-wage workers, those who are most affected and, and by these issues, that they're really at the center of the solutions, that they're really contributing. So we know in the US that low-wage workers, especially women and low-wage workers of color, um, are most likely to see wage stagnation or even displacement as a result of a lot of these trends. So they should really be at the center. Um, and we saw this play out in New York recently with um, the Fast Food Wage Board a couple of years ago, where government, business, workers all came together and came up with some really nuanced solutions to raise worker pay, but also to roll it out in a more um, incremental way in economically depressed parts of the state. Um, so I think it shows that type of sophistication and nuance and not sort of us versus them that we lose a lot in the US right now. Um, and there's a lot of potential for it still. Thank you, Rachel. And just you mentioned that you look forward to seeing more discussions around mm -hmm. UBI. I also wanted to say that UBI is untested. Only one country really try to implement it, that is Mongolia. So it, which we should welcome more discussions mm -hmm. considering how many governments are actually planning mm -hmm. to, to implement it. I would like to ask you a second question. So you recently published um, a fourth month study investigation about independent work, flexible work, mm -hmm. which is also you know, a very um, important topic and we hear different views um, about it. Like the fact that it might bring more opportunities, for example, for working moms, because it gives flexibility, so it might be an, easy, an easier access to labor markets, but at the same time, it brings a lot of insecurity, because those are the flexible workers that also don't get access to social mm -hmm. protection. Also, those workers are not really classified, right? Because those, that kind of gig type of work uh, blurs the line between formal and informal, so oftentimes they don't fit in any categories. Uh, so, so would you like to share your views about about that and perhaps some of the results of that of your investigation? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in the U.S., we're talking about um, 10 to 35 percent of the workforce who are contingent workers or independent workers. That's a huge range, and that gets at a lot of problems, actually, with the data and how this is co collected here. Um, but without getting into that, what I think is really important to keep in mind in the U.S. with independent work is that this model of sort of one job for life. You join GE or Ford um, and you stay at that company for 30 years and rise up through the ranks. Um, not only is that not the reality anymore, but it actually was just kind of a blip on the screen um, as far as US history goes that it ever was. Um, but the challenge is a lot of our core labor policies and um, social safety net policies were developed during that part of American history. And in fact, baby boomers were at the peak of their careers when a lot of this was going on. And baby boomers are, of course, uh, in very influential policymaking roles in the US. So we still have this kind of outdated mental model informing a lot of our policies and our policy conversations around independent work. Um, so I think what is important here is that we don't try to go backwards to this idea of one job for life, everyone should you know, have a long-term role in one place, but we embrace a lot of these um, sort of changing roles. Um, there's a lot of research showing that workers really like the flexibility, but there's a lot of downsides as well, such as volatility and pay. Um, so instead, we can try to kind of update and reimagine a lot of our labor and social safety net policies to accommodate today's reality. Um, for example, one where I think we're seeing a lot of both business practice innovation and state policy change is around portable benefits. So this idea that just because you are an independent worker, you should still be able to, and you don't have just one employer that you go to every day, you still are entitled to health insurance. And whether you're driving on Lyft one day or walking a dog on a different platform the other day, you should be gaining and accruing towards your health insurance. And I think we're going to see a lot of technologies helping to um, enable that. 
Thank you. And we see some companies trying to provide some social insurance at the moment, but still uh, very like few mm -hmm. initiatives here and there.